In 1967, Pirates of the Caribbean opened at Disneyland featuring a slow-moving flume ride through the golden age of piracy. Being one of the last rides Walt Disney had a hand in, it was a resounding success both in theming, rider capacity, and technology. If we fast forward to 2016, Disney would introduce Pirates of the Caribbean Battle for the Sunken Treasure, a completely modern take on the revered classic. Today on Amusement Labs, we'll take an excruciatingly detailed look at the hidden engineering and technology behind Pirates of the Caribbean Battle for the Sunken Treasure. So sit back, relax, grab a snack, and get comfortable, because this is how it works. This video was supported by Felix Montesa, Brandon Wiggins, and viewers like you on patreon.com slash amusement labs. Enjoy early access and more by joining. The original Pirates of the Caribbean has a deep-rooted legacy, so let's jump back in time to the early decades of Disneyland, Walt Disney's Magic Kingdom. We've had a lot of our dreams come true. Now we want you to share with us our latest and greatest dream. A pinnacle of Disney's inventive nature, Pirates of the Caribbean opened with over 100 hydraulic moving figures, large pirate ship sets, and over 630,000 gallons of water to create the flowing rivers and high seas guests navigate. Oh, you want to see some? Love to. Right over here, we'll meet them. This little miniature here is taken first from a sketch. We make these sketches to figure out the types and the characters. This will animate when we have it in the show, you know. Pirates of the Caribbean travels through caverns, between massive ships, and through pillaged towns along the way. No Disney destination park is complete without an opportunity for guests to head on an adventure into the past, seeing the sights, sounds, and smells of this universally recognizable classic. Wherever Disney ventures, new journeys, rides, and technology rise from the ground with the intent to inspire and entertain. As we progress through time, the ride has changed slightly over its many decades of operation, offering new yet timeless effects that bring the pirates of the past back to life before our eyes. The opening of Shanghai Disneyland in 2016 marked the end of years poured into the creation of a multi-billion dollar project for the Walt Disney Company and the Shanghai Shende Group. Opening with a breathtaking castle and intricately detailed lands, Shanghai Disneyland is a look at Disney's modern creative abilities. No ride at the park is a better example of this than Pirates of the Caribbean Battle for the Sunken Treasure. During early development of the park, it was clear a simple copy of Pirates of the Caribbean would not satisfy what modern guests demanded. Wanting only the best for the new park, some rides went in a completely different creative direction, but as with Pirates, the Imagineers realized the treasure trove of ideas the ride sat on. It was soon decided that the new attraction should focus on the modern and more recognizable Pirates of the Caribbean movie franchise, more prominently featuring Johnny Depp's Jack Sparrow. This ride would be a completely modernized offering using new groundbreaking technology dropping riders right into the film franchise while paying homage to the original. Keeping with the style of the original attraction, Battle for the Sunken Treasure would seek to match its scale and level of detail, but in its own unique way. Originally, the ride was to include large ships on motion bases holding up to 60 passengers each, but this was later altered in favor of many smaller boats utilizing an ingenious ride system. Taking place in Disney's largest show building ever, Battle for the Sunken Treasure takes place behind a fortress in the Treasure Cove section of the park. At around 200,000 square feet, the building contains the ride and its Blue Bayou style counterpart restaurant. 
Surrounded by a tropical ambiance, the ride sits as the centerpiece of this harbor, home to our infamous pirates. Just after being approved, the development team set out to create a prototype of the ride system in Glendale, California, and later tested some of the preliminary scenes on it as well. To understand the ride's mechanics, we'll start with the boat itself. Seating up to 30 guests at a time, these large boats primarily float in the waters of the flume. When they are taken out of the water for work, they must be stored on a special rack that supports the weight of the boat from underneath and secures the mechanics we'll talk about soon. While in service, each boat comes out of the water to load and unload riders. To move the boats when doing this, there are motorized conveyor belts lining the sides of the path that slide the boat forward and up out of the water. During this time, the weight of the boat and passengers is resting on load-bearing wheels fixed on the bottom of the boat that roll on a running surface. When in the station, a side bumper will push contacts into the boat to activate and release the restraint bar of the boat and will also charge the power system used for the boat's onboard audio. With the design of this new ride system, this is where the similarities to the original attraction end. Battle for the Sunken Treasure does not rely on the gradual flow of water to move riders through scenes like the original. Leaning on the franchise, Imagineers wanted to make the ride less passive by animating scenes around riders that relied on controlled movements, but before you predict how it works, the boat does not have a motor in the back. Located underneath the boat are two large rotational bearings that connect the boat to a rotated mechanical tug, or bar, that's shaped like a triangle. In this setup, the triangle leaves the bearing and comes to a point below the surface of the water. This mechanical tug is also allowed to rotate slightly downward to reach the lower mechanics of the ride system. As the name suggests, these mechanical tugs need to be towed by another module or assembly. Far below the surface of the water, a wheel assembly connects to each of the boat's two mechanical tugs. These wheel assemblies meet the tugs at the end and connect through a universal joint on top of the wheel assembly, allowing for a versatile and sturdy connection. The wheel assemblies themselves are made up of a central body and two types of wheels serving different functions. Starting in the middle, the wheel assembly rolls on what are called road wheels that carry the bulk of the weight. On each assembly, there are four of these wheels, two on each side of the assembly body. Extending from the sides of the wheel assembly body are lateral plates. From these lateral plates, the second kind of wheels, called guide wheels, are connected. In this assembly, these guide wheels are mounted either on top of the lateral plate for the front assembly or below the lateral plates for the rear assembly. There are two guide wheels per lateral plate with a total of four guide wheels per assembly. Wanting to control each boat, Imagineers ripped a page from Disney World's past by relying on the use of linear induction motors to move the boats. For those that don't know, linear induction motors are essentially electromagnets with long continuous loops of wire around an iron core. On the bottom of each wheel assembly body is an aluminum and steel sheet called a reaction plate. When these linear induction motors are turned on at a 60 Hz frequency, they induce a magnetic attraction and repulsion in the plates. This then can be carefully calibrated to precisely control the boat's movement. These linear induction motors are mounted below the reaction plates and the wheel assembly bodies in the middle of their path to make sure that they are propelled where needed. When the assemblies are moved, they tow the boat with them. With control of the boats for distinct scenes, there are also hold points around the ride where boats may temporarily stop should there be traffic upstream. These stops are also strategically placed to not break the storyline. However, Imagineers simply could not stop there with a boat version of the People Mover. That wouldn't be very innovative. Below the surface, the wheel assemblies do not just roll freely on the floor under each boat, but are fixed to a complex track system. 
Each wheel assembly rolls within the confines of this intricate track with the top mounted guide wheel assembly towing the boat in the front and the bottom mounted guide wheel assembly towing in the rear. The road wheels of the assembly roll on the flat surface on opposite sides of the linear induction motors in the middle of the track. Meanwhile, the guide wheels roll on rails with two rails on each side, one for the top guide wheels shown in red and one for the bottom guide wheels shown in blue. However, Imagineers were not interested in a simple towing system on a track. They wanted something unique and at points thrilling to sell this technological adventure. The ride system they developed not only allows them to control the boat's motion, but the direction it faces. The reason the guide wheels are mounted differently on the front assembly versus the back is specifically for this reason. When the wheel assemblies reach the intersection, two of the guide wheels enter a small channel. If the guide wheels match where the channel is, the assembly is forced to a specific track. Meanwhile, the other assembly meets a different channel that forces it onto the other track. The wheel assemblies are now separated onto two different tracks and can move at different rates to affect the orientation of the boat. To merge the assemblies back onto the main track, the process reverses. With the help of this ingenious ride system, the boats not only can travel forward, but lets the boats travel sideways and backwards. In this demonstration, we have a simple U-shaped split of the track. When the front assembly reaches the intersection, the upper channel grabs the guide wheels on top and forces them onto track A. When the rear assembly gets to the intersection, the channel below grabs the guide wheels located on the bottom and forces the assembly onto track B. This rotates the boat, facing it towards the center of the U-shape. If the front assembly moves at the same left to right speed as the rear assembly, the boat moves sideways and re-enters the main track forwards. However, if the front assembly on track B moves faster than the rear assembly on track A, it'll enter the intersection first, causing the boat to re-enter the main track backwards. Varying the speed of these assemblies can also lead to a combination of these motions. It's with this intricate and ingenious design that the team was able to create moving scenes and control the view of riders throughout their journey, heightening their experience. When piecing together this attraction, Disney was looking to meld together expansive sets and immersive media to transport riders into the middle of the action. To achieve this, the ride employs multiple floor-to-ceiling screens onto which incredibly realistic backdrops and action scenes are projected. In partnership with Industrial Light and Magic, the climactic and detailed scenes from the film franchise came to life with added dimension thanks to moving viewpoint compensation, also known as squinching. By integrating screens with proper lighting of equal intensity, it's very difficult at times to see where screens are. When the ride first opened, one of the most talked about special effects on the ride was a skeleton to human transformation of Jack Sparrow. This effect brought together three of the ride's main features, animatronics, the controlled boats, and screens. In order to pull this effect off, we have to again travel back in time to the infamous Pepper's Ghost effect, where a seemingly invisible glass sheet angled over a scene reflects a prop giving it a ghost-like effect. In this effect, the design team has taken advantage of the rider's straightforward view of a wrecked ship by positioning the boat's travel parallel to the ship. Hidden within the sail ropes is a tightly stretched film that is reflecting a prop or a screen that lays flat on the floor. A skeleton is shown reflecting off the film and seemingly into the ship steering the wreck. With a sparkling projected transition, the skeleton disappears in a well-articulated Jack Sparrow animatronic, hiding in the dark the whole time, is illuminated, taking place of the skeleton. For this effect, timing is important, as if riders stop short or the effect started late, the transition would be ruined, making it obvious that the skeleton was simply not actually there. Uh -huh. 
Because the ride is less of a trip through a general pirate ride, more of the movie specific characters make an appearance in the ride. Unlike its original Pirates of the Caribbean counterparts, Battle for the Sunken Treasure actually only features four animatronics based through the ride. Each figure is a well-articulated figure featuring different articulation methods. However, here's a fun little fact. While the ride features four animatronics, only three of them are full-bodied. The Mechas figure is the only one being only a figure of his upper torso. During the ride, you'll see each figure starting and ending with Jack Sparrow steering the wreck through a materializing effect and at the end with a disappearing bounty. Now that we understand the technology, let's hop aboard to see it in action. Splashing back down into the water, we set sail past the indoor restaurant heading into our first cavern past an homage to the original attraction's jail cell scene. We now approach the skeleton to life transformation and our boat begins to slide sideways, now moving backwards. The track splits, pointing the boat towards a floor-to-ceiling screen, sending us underwater. The tracks merge back together, and the boat is now traveling forward into the depths of the sea after the sunken treasure. Passing through the treasure, Mecha sends us through to Davy Jones, complete with an organ and large window screen. We leave the ship and resurface, with the tracks splitting again, sending us sideways for a longer view of the enormous screen. As an all-out battle takes place around us, the tracks merge back together for a brief travel between the ships before splitting again. We drift backwards into the damaged ship before rotating counterclockwise to see Jack Sparrow sword fighting David Jones. The track rejoins the assemblies before taking us backwards up a small lift and as water fills the ship, we drop backwards on those load-bearing wheels. We splash backwards and the track splits and reconnects one last time to let the boat rotate back to traveling forward. We then see Jack enjoying some trick treasure before the wine and table flip around to show a black side making it seem as if they've disappeared. The story concludes and the boat slowly makes its way back to the station where guests can unload and enjoy the rest of their adventure filled day. Altogether, Pirates of the Caribbean Battle for the Sunken Treasure is a masterful story driven blend of unique technology an unwavering devotion to immersion. All different in its own ways, it truly is a triumph in taking on and modernizing an iconic classic. And so our journey comes to an end. We've explored the technology, engineering, and innovation behind Pirates of the Caribbean Battle for the Sunken Treasure, a truly amazing take on a legendary classic. Which Pirates of the Caribbean ride do you think is better? If you liked this video, please subscribe and support us on Patreon for perks like models, behind the scenes looks, and early access. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the parks.